audience. Um, before I introduce our guest speaker for today, I would like to mention um, that this uh, visit and uh, this lecture was organized by and supported by an uh, international optical society called SPIE uh, and also organized by our national uh, student chapter of uh, SPIE, that is University of Latvia student chapter. Um, and uh, I would also like to mention that uh, if any of you would be interested in uh, joining our chapter and becoming members of uh, SPIE, then uh, please free, feel free to uh, come to me after the lecture and ask about it. And also, uh, you can leave your email here on this page, and, and then I will inform you about all the benefits and, and possibilities so you can um, yeah, be, become members if you would like. So, and uh, now I have the honor to introduce our guest speaker, uh, Professor Francesco Pavone from Italy, Florence. Uh, he's a professor at the University of Florence and uh, also a scientific responsible of the um, biophotonics and biophysics laboratory of European Laboratory for Nonlinear Spectroscopy. So thank you very much for coming to Latvia. It's really been a great pleasure and Thank you, Inga, and let me thank uh, also Professor Janis Pigulis for inviting me, and uh, Inga and Marta for a wonderful uh, dinner yesterday. And uh, it's it's a great pleasure to be here. I I'm pretty much impressed from the town, from the beauty of the town, and um, also how big is this university. So today. I, I would like to, to talk of a project, of a, of a tool, of, let's say of a topic about biophotonics. And I'm sorry if I'm going to repeat a few arguments that I already was showing uh, this morning. So there are ma maybe there are a few people that also attended the, the lecture this morning. But most of the things, uh, they will be different. And uh, I'm working at the European Laboratory for Lonia Spectroscopy. This is a center of excellence in, uh, in Italy, and uh, this is also an infrastructure of the European community. And the biophotonics is one of the fourth area inside. So the talk of today will be mainly based on two things, the shape and the functionality. Uh, this morning I was discussing these two topics of shape and functionality in a neural network, in brain. Uh, this afternoon I will talk about uh, these two features, shape and functionality, in other, good morning, in uh, evening, <laughs> in other tissue organs, okay, not only brain, in the last part I will repeat what I told this uh, morning about the brain, but I will talk about tissues like uh, skin, <coughs> bladder, for example, cornea, and so on. And uh, the shape and the functionality are two essential parts of our life and if you take uh, many many phenomena you realize that uh, they are connected pretty much pretty much together and uh, if you look at for example histology and what histopathologists they are doing they are exactly looking at the shape okay or at the chemistry with the immunohistochemistry to to have then uh, uh, the connections between the shape and the functionality. Functionality means uh, abundances of some, some kind of proteins in cells and the shape of the cells it's also makes a difference. Think about uh, metastasis for example. The way the cells they organize in 3D it depends a lot on cell pathway. It depends a lot on the cell functionality and it, it depends a lot on how the protein are distributed in a cells. Think about the motility of a cell. The proteins, the membrane proteins, what they are called the focal adhesion points, for example, in a translocated uh, uh, molecule, in a translocated cell, the beta integrin, for example, molecule, which are uh, adhesion molecule on the membrane, they localize in a different way depending on the type of motility of the cells. So there is a, a tight connection between the cell pathway and the shape of the cell and the 3D organization 
Also, a single cell acts completely different in a cell in a, in a big env environment. If you take, for example, a cardiomyocyte, a cell from the heart, and you study the functionality of, of an isolated cardiomyocyte, then you discover that when this cardiomyocyte is within the tissue, the behavior is completely different. Because it exists a, sto a sort of a swarm intelligence, we were talking about this also this morning, which regulates the collective phenomenon altogether and makes the, uh, the behavior of an individual, uh, this is also up, acts in society, to be completely different when it is inserted in an environment. Now, let's concentrate on morphology. Of course, morphology means microscopy, means uh, tools which are able to see the shapes of the cells. And uh, everybody knows probably that uh, there are wide field microscopes and everybody probably is using in his lab a wide field microscope. But maybe some people are also using confocal microscopes. And confocal microscopes, uh, they are pretty much diffused now. And the advantage they have with respect to wide field microscope is that they have an optical sectioning which is much, much better with respect to a wide field microscope. And that allows you to have, for example, the optical sectioning of some samples and make a 3D stack, so to make a wool 3D tomography of something you want to image. Then, a new technology was coming out in the 90s after 60 years of incubation. And uh, this is two photon microscope. And now, as you can see, they are uh, increasing a lot, the number of experiments with two photon microscopes. And uh, the difference with respect to one photon microscope is the following. When you want to see something with a laser, you shine a photon, and the photon excites the molecule, the chromophore, a green fluorescence protein, a Texas red, whatever, a CY5, whatever molecule which emit photons by means of fluorescence. And this is what happened. The photon excites the molecule and then the molecule emits fluorescence. But then you have another phenomenon also that uh, you can excite with two photons which have uh, half a power, okay, and you emit exactly the same photon in fluorescence. Which is the advantage of uh, a confocal systems like this with respect to, to a photon microscope? Well, the advantage is that if you take two cuvettes which are containing fluorescence, which is excited and emit fluorescence with laser, in one photon phenomenon, all the beam is exciting the cuvette and all the molecule into the beam here. Here is the microscope objective, which is focalizing the laser inside here, are emitting. So you are exciting all the sample. Here you don't see anything because the system is uh, absorbing. In two photon, look, you have only this point, which is one femtoliter. Why? Because here and here, the density of energy, because it's not focalized, is not enough to have this two photon process. This two photon process occurs only into the focus. It's just like when you want to burn a piece of paper with the light of the, of the, of the sun, then you focalize. If you put the piece of paper out of the focus, you don't burn anything, but you just burn into the focus. There's exactly the same things with the two photon process. Now, the advantage here is that you have an optical sectioning from ab initio. So you do not need to use uh, a, a, a filter, an optical filter, like in a confocal microscope, to have optical sectioning, but you have from the beginning. But another advantage is that you are moving into the infrared and the tissue are more transparent into the infrared. The water is not absorbing. The photodamaging is less, so you can go deeper. And another advantage is that going deeper, if you have scattering into the tissue, because the tissue is a turbid media, it's not transparent like the glass you see here, the brain, the skin, the liver, the pancreas, it's a turbid media, then of course not all the photons are going into the focus. 
but in uh, one photon emission, all the photons they are contributing to the signals. And so you lose resolution with the confocal. If you use a confocal microscope, you cannot go deep into the tissue. With a two photon microscope, the photons which are not reaching the, photo, the, the focus, they are not simply giving any signal. So you don't lose resolution, you lose signal going deep with the two photon. But then you can recover by increasing the laser power. So another take home message is that with two photon microscope you can go deep, with one photon microscope you cannot go deep. Then of course you have the problem of collecting the photons which are emitted by fluorescence and this is a problem you cannot avoid anymore. And then this is the last, I promise, slides complicated and then we will move to medicine, okay? But just to be complete, there is another phenomenon which is called second harmonic generation. That means that two photons are converted in a photon which has exactly double frequency of those two photons. This is in physics is called coherent process because uh, what happened here is that these two photons are immediately converted. So this is uh, an emitter which acts like an antenna. And uh, if uh, these emitters, which can be, for example, chiral molecules, which are molecules with an electron channel inside and two different electron affinity on the border, so they are, uh, let's say, non-symmetric molecules. What happens in this case is that, uh, in this case, uh, you have, uh, is, this is the oscillatory electromagnetic field, the electrons are oscillating like the electron field. But uh, if they go here, the affinity is higher. They want to remain more here. And here the affinity is lower. This is the donor, this is the acceptor. So the electrons, what they do, they oscillate in this way. Okay, because they want to stay more here than here. But if you analyze this signal, this is composed by the principal oscillator and by a second harmonic oscillator. So these asymmetric molecules, they act like a calculator. They just double the frequency. You enter with red light, you, you, you go out with blue light. So it's a magic box that transfers the double the frequency. Now, this is interesting, why? Because these uh, emitters, which are double the frequency, you will see they are collagen molecules, for example. They are uh, myosin molecules. What those molecules are doing is that if uh, the dipole are ordered, these signals are interfering constructively. If, uh, for example, the molecules are upside down, this signal interferes destructively. If the molecules are randomly disposed, the signal does not interfere at all. So what does it mean? It means that uh, if, for example, the molecules are ordered in, an, in a membrane of a cell, the second harmonic from the membrane will be very, very high. But if the molecules are dispersed in the cytoplasm, for example, the signal in second harmonic from cytoplasm will be low because it will be not enhanced by the interference. Finally, chemistry. This is shape. What about functionality? Functionality is chemistry. And to do chemistry, we need to assess the chemical content. One possibility to assess the chemical content is the lifetime detection. If I use, for example, 150 femtosecond lasers, okay, then uh, I excite the molecule in the upper state, and then the laser is off. I wait. And the, this state, uh, as uh, um, is falling down in this case is emitting with the after a, a, a time which is uh, called a lifetime of the upper state which is typical of each molecule or each molecule has a different lifetime depending on the environment so by checking the lifetime state of the upper state you can check which kind of molecule is emitting and in which environment is emitting. So it's a sort of the fingerprint of the molecule. Another feature 
in a molecule, it's to assess the rotovibrational states of the manifold of the fundamental state. In this case, for example, this is the fundamental state, this is the upper state, okay? What you could do, for example, instead of doing a directly infrared <coughs> detection here, you use two lasers with a phenomenon which is called uh, Raman, or you can use also a stimulated Raman process with the, a scheme which is called coherent anti-Raman scatterings, CARS. In this case, the molecule is going from here throughout a virtual state to here, and from here, and then you have an emission, which is a stimulated emission here. So by tuning this or this, what you do, you do exactly the spectrum of uh, the infrared spectrum, but you do in the visible, of these states. And again, the infrared spectrum of uh, the vibrational states, it's a wonderful fingerprint of the molecule. So there are many things, many ways you can assess the fingerprint. The nice news is that uh, if you use a two second, two photon excitation, and I think that. Let me try. I will try by myself. I'm a physicist, so I can do that. <laughs> okay, so um, in that case, the window between 700 nanometer and 1000 nanometer, which is exactly the window for the two photon excitation, it's a good window because the water does not absorb so much in tissues. And the second nice news is that uh, <coughs> the cross-section, T-photon cross-section, that is the capability that those molecules have to be excited in the excited state with a two-photon process, it's quite good and they are large, you see. With a unique wavelength, you can excite uh, in parallel different kinds of molecules. And those molecules, those molecules are pretty much important in many tissues. And this is without any added probe. This is in autofluorescence. And this is essential when you talk about humans, because in animals you can put some external labels. You may have a transgenic animal, but for a human this is pretty difficult to have. So label-free detection and assessment of uh, uh, tissues characteristics is one of the most important issues in clinics. Just to show you, for example, how, how specific can be the Raman spectrum. This is centimeters minus one, and you see that uh, in, in a few parts there are uh, some proteins, or even the DNA, or the CH, CH stretch of lipids or of proteins, they have uh, particular resonances which uh, uh, somehow are very characteristic of that kind of, uh, of component. Okay, now let's combine the two things and let's, let's start to work on real uh, clinics cases. Uh, I will show you in the beginning some ex vivo samples and I will show you in the second part uh, uh, measurements on patients. Now, two photon detection. We are talking now of bladder, okay? So if I take for example healthy mucosa or a carcinoma in situ and I make a scanning with my laser, with two photon laser, so I go deep in autofluorescence, I can see the cells, I can see the contour of the cell, I can see the nucleus. This is uh, the cytoplasm which is uh, autofluorescence, the nucleus, so the DNA is not fluorescing at that wavelength. I can assess the dimension of the nucleus and the dimension of the cells. And the histopathologists, that's exactly what they are doing when they classify tumor. And then what you do, 
you make a sort of automated image pattern recognition system which automatically assess the nucleus the nucleus to cell ratio and then you see that uh, for the carcinoma in situ the distribution of cellular to nuclear uh, nuclear area ratio is completely different with respect to healthy mucosa so the first thing is an optical biopsy so it's a non-contact mode to make exactly what histopathologists they are doing but you do without uh, excising the tissues, without touching the tissues. So non-contact mode. And then you go to colon, for example, the tumor of the colon. And you do the opposite. You, you see the LT mucosa, how well the cells are visible. Then you go to a polyp, and then you go to colon tumor. Immediately, immediately you see that the shape of the cells in a colon tumor are completely different from the LT mucosa and from the polyp. And now if you make the same, uh, oh sorry, if you make the same operation and you make, for example, the cellular to nucleus ratio, you see that the three different kind of, uh, of situation are clustered differently. And also, if I look at the asymmetry of the cell because the cell can be quite round here and quite elliptic here I see that also the asymmetry of the cell is different from the three cases and so I have also a clustering here so this is something that uh, histopathologists are doing oftenly on uh, histopathological slices and we are doing here uh, without removing anything Second harmonic. Second harmonic collagen emits a lot of second harmonic. And as I told you, second harmonic is enhanced when the system is ordered. Look, these are collagen fibers that can be seen very, very well in second harmonic. This is artificial collagen that you can grow on a cover slice. This is LT dermis, the collagen that you have in the dermis. And this is keloid. Keloid for dermatologists, it's a disease of, uh, of, the, of collagen. You see how the order is different from here to here, okay? Now, you must assess the order. I, I don't want to, to, to spend my time with the uh, image pattern recognition analysis, but uh, uh, because most of you, they are not physicists. So, but uh, it is possible to assess a sort of length of order. In other words, that's the distance over which the direction of the collagen is lost. If you assess the length of order with a sort of entropy parameter, but there are many ways you can do that, then you see that for the artificial collagen, the length of order that is uh, the, 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 the dimension in which the collagen is preserved as uh, order is one micron. Healthy dermis is three micron and keloid is 6.8 micron. Now think about this is a number and uh, medical doctors they don't want equations they want a button to push and a number to come out. That's the most difficult things you can give to a medical doctor okay and not because they are stupid but because uh, for clinics they just need a friendly use and simple system. Otherwise, it's just a toy for phys physicists and it's not useful. So this is a parameter which can be very, very useful in clinics when you want to assess, for example, the pathology of, uh, of, uh, of collagen in skin. But also the collagen plays an enormous role around uh, the tumor. This is, for example, uh, basal cell carcinoma uh, this is the tumor this is a second harmonic generation signal this is two photon this is the merging you see here how the co this is the tumor and this is the stroma you see around the tumor the stroma how the collagen is well ordered and then if you go in the dermis it's disorder again why because the collagen is defending the body so it's trying to contain the tumor and create a barrier of fibers, as you can see here. 
So is this a mechanical stress that creates this barrier of fibers? The answer is no. It's again morphochemistry. It's again the signaling of the cells which are <coughs> building up <coughs> the collagen. They have a, sp a special signaling inside of the cells in order to build a collagen with this geometry, more than this. It's a fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. The cells, they know where they are and they know which kind of collagen they have to produce. And it's only around the tumor. So now, since you have uh, the collagen, the second harmonic from the collagen, and the two photons from the elastin, because elastin is emitting two photon fluorescence and collagen is emitting second harmonic, then you can make the ratio between the intensity of second harmonic and the intensity of two, of, uh, of, uh, two photons. That is the amount of collagen and the amount of elastin. This kind of index was used for the first time for the photo aging. If you take uh, a young woman, for example, or a young man, and uh, you measure the content of collagen when they are young <coughs> with respect to elastin, <coughs> the photo aging index is pretty much high. In other words, the amount of uh, elastin is quite high. But uh, when a woman or a man they get older, the amount of elastin is going away and the elastin is giving the elasticity to the cell, as elastin says, the word. So, this is uh, an index which can be used to measure photoaging. And this is not only for uh, aesthetical purposes. May I have some water, please, somewhere? <coughs> for aesthetical purposes. But uh, uh, this is also useful when you want to, for example, characterize a stroma. See here this index, how different it is from a basal cell carcinoma, from a stroma or from a dermis. So that makes a, a huge difference. This is, again, this is again an index that clinician can use to assess uh, different kind of uh, regions if you are in the basal cell carcinoma, if you are in the stroma, or if you are in the dermis. Again, if you go to connective tissues, okay, and uh, this is, uh, uh, for example, when you have a scar after an operation, the keloid, keloid is a degeneration of a scar. And keloid, it is uh, a form of disease of, uh, of collagen. And again, you see here that the order is different. And if you, again, make the measurement with this uh, index ratio, it is pretty much different. So dermatologists can use a bit, a lot, this kind of, of score to assess if this is healthy dermis, normal scar of keloid. And in the plastic surgery, it's very important. Because in plastic surgery, if someone goes to make a plastic surgery, it's because they want to improve the aesthetics. But keloid, keloid is not aesthetic anymore because keloid is a grow, is abnormal grow of collagen. But let's move to more serious things, to melanoma. Now, when a, a, a dermatologist has to assess a melanoma, sometimes it's very difficult because the melanocytic nevus is uh, pretty similar to melanoma, but uh, it's, uh, it's not, uh, thank you Inga, but uh, <coughs> it's, it's not malignous. So, usually if you go to a dermatologist, what they do is that they remove, they don't know and they remove just because by risk, not to have risk, they remove. Then the histopathologist says, okay, this is okay, this is good, or this is bad. By doing, by doing an uh, optical um, biopsy in this way, you do not uh, need to remove uh, because you can distinguish, for example, uh, the second harmonic, which is uh, the blue one, from the two photon, which is the green one, which have a different feature. For example, let's make an example. This, these are the two images, okay, uh, separated. Two photon and second harmonic for a melanocytic nevus. For example, what happened here is that uh, in a melanocytic nevus or a dysplastic nevus, 
which are nevus, pretty similar to, to melanoma, but we, which are benignous, not malignous. Okay, here the collagen is parallel to the tissue surface in a non-malignant lesions, so while in a malignant lesions is perpendicular to the surface. So, the collagen itself, in the same nevus, if the nevus is malignant or is benignous, is changing direction. Okay? So, uh, assessing the direction of collagen is absolutely pretty important. But is the skin uh, the, or the, the uh, organ where the collagen is present? Oh, there is another organ, fully done of collagen, which is the cornea. Okay? If you look with second harmonic, if you look by eye, cornea is completely transparent. But if you look to second harmonic, you see immediately the collagen in cornea. You should see. Okay. Here we go. This is a stack in Z, okay? All, all the dimension of the cornea. You see how, how well the collagen fibers are visible in the cornea. And uh, this is a non-contact mode. So, think about the keratocone. The keratocone is a pathology of the cornea where the collagen, which is absolutely ordered, that's why the cornea is transparent, becomes not ordered. And that's because the cornea becomes opaque. So, uh, there are no instruments nowadays in ophthalmology to detect keratocone. And that's the first example in which you may use a non-contact mode laser not only to make the surgery of the cornea but also to assess a pathology like keratocone. Or for example, when, when do you use lasers? You use lasers for LASIK. You know LASIK what it is? The LASIK is when they cut the cornea with the laser, they remove the cornea, they change inside what they have to change and then they place the cornea again. And then what uh, before the ophthalmologists they were doing, they were by hand closing the cornea. But when you close by hand, if you make a mistake, you have a tension from one side, you induce a deformation of the cornea, then you induce a defect in visual, in vision. So, what's the best way to, me to, to, to melt the cornea? It's by using laser again. So, you can use the laser to cut, you can use the laser to melt the cornea again. And that's very precise microsurgery operation. The problem is that the laser is eating up and the collagen above 65 degrees degenerate. Completely becomes uh, not order anymore. So, what we do we study, for example, after this is the place where the laser is melting in the cornea, for example, uh, the, uh, the, uh, is melting the cornea. And if this is the cornea far away, 600 microns here. And when you approach the laser welding, you see how the, <coughs> the collagen is becoming disordered. Why? because it's increasing the temperature. This is 35 degrees, which is the room, this is the body temperature, and then you arrive to 65 degrees, which is the laser temperature, which is eating the, the sample. So, when you use a laser to weld, before it was done very easily, but then uh, we discovered that uh, the systems can be damaged by the laser. So, this is not good anymore. You see here, this is the cornea far away from the, from the laser and this is in the region of laser. You see how you lose completely the order here. And here the cornea becomes opaque because you lose the order. Another way, I, I don't want to go into details, but uh, you, can, uh, you can see the direction of the collagen is because uh, the second harmonic is maximum when the laser, and this is a, a, a message for physicists, when the laser polarization is in the same direction of the collagen molecule. So if you rotate the laser polarization, you have a maximum when you have zero degrees and minimum at 90 degrees. 
And that's the profile of intensity while you are rotating the polarization. If you fit this with a theoretical model, you obtain the direction of the collagen molecule. And then what you can do at that point, it's in a, in a collagen, it's a, it's a map of direction. Every color here is a direction into the space. So you can here, for example, see how the direction of the molecule into the space are ordered. And that's a very, very refined uh, system to obtain again the length of order that I was telling you before, which is going down, down and down as soon as we are approaching the melting region. So, chemistry, morphology, functionality. What is the most, one of the most important aspects of functionality is in, a, in a tumor? Well, it's, it's metabolism. And uh, what happened? Well, you have uh, two kinds of phenomenon. One is the oxidative phosphorylation, and the other one is the glycolysis. In a tumor, the absence of oxygen makes the systems unbalanced throughout the, the glycolysis. In a healthy tissues, instead, the presence of oxygen makes the systems more favorable on the side of the oxidative phosphorylation. Now, if you look properly inside here, you see that uh, there are the component of uh, these molecules which are called N. AD or NADH and some other molecule which are called FAD is completely different. For example, here only NADH is involved and non FAD. Here they are both involved instead. Now, <coughs> what you can do is that exactly detecting spectroscopically those two molecules, NAD and FADH. And in that case, you can easily done with a TIF photon at 740 nanometer and 890. So suppose you make an image by detecting the abundance of NADH and the abundance on FAD, and then you make again a ratio between the intensity of FAD and the intensity of NADH. If you make a normalized ratio, this is exactly the redox ratio. And the redox ratio, it's uh, an index which tells you which is the metabolism in that point. At that point, uh, you make an image where you don't show anymore the intensity of fluorescence. The intensity of the pixel is the redox ratio number. So this is uh, a a, a, an image for clinicists, because, uh, for clinicians, because in that case, you see here that uh, uh, the, the, the white for example, correspond to a higher metabolism and the black to a lower metabolism. So you can see directly in an image <coughs> the amount of metabolism. So take, for example, the bladder, just to show you <coughs> how different can be an image in this case. This is an image of LT mucosa in false color of, of redox ratio, and this is an image of carcinoma in situ. You see how different they are. So this is a visual way to suggest to clinicians that something is happening at the metabolic level. But take the colon, for example. This is uh, very, very explicative. If you take a healthy mucosa, you, you take these images in false, false color of metabolism, you see how the polyp is much more near to the colon tumor than to the healthy mucosa. That's why when they make an endoscopy and they find a polyp, you have to follow up because the metabolism of a polyp is pretty, pretty similar to the tumor. And it's very uh, easy that uh, a polyp, if it is uh, more than one centimeter of, of the, the dimension, they can translate in a tumor after a few years. So that's why you have to follow up the polyps pretty much. Now, of course, uh, 
everything works well when you put everything together. Second harmonic, two photon, cars for example, and every one of those uh, signals is giving you a complementary information. One important issue, for example, are arteriosclerotic plaques. This is a, a section of an artery, and here, in this artery, you have uh, in, uh, uh, in red the cars. These are lipids, okay? Because the car signal is giving lipids. In green, two photon, and these are elastic fibers. Okay, this is the cross section of, our, of an arteria. And in blue, you have two, uh, second harmonic. This is collagen, okay? So, you can uh, distinguish the three images, one with respect to each other. And let me tell you an example where we see a very interesting thing. If you take cars and you take second harmonic generation, what you do here is the following. You take different zones, and what you do here, it's uh, unlikely here the, the, uh, the, the contrast is not very high. In this point, if I make cars, this is the Raman spectrum, okay? Every molecule has its own Raman spectrum. So the Raman spectrum here is the fingerprint, like your face. Your face is unique like uh, the Raman spectrum. So every mo molecule has his own face, his own Raman spectrum. So I associate every color here to different molecules, okay? So I can, in principle, know the composition of molecules with Raman spectrum. Then what I discover here, okay, that uh, in the point in which there is second harmonic, okay, there is a Raman corresponding to cholesterol. So I found that cholesterol is producing second harmonic. And but this is an important discovery because uh, I can at that point bring an endoscope and in the last part of my talk I will show you that. I can bring the endoscope directly and this has been done on rabbit for example, on the arteriosclerotic plaque and I can check first the degree of cholesterol. Second, the degree of uh, organization of collagen. Because plaques are not dangerous un unless they are closing the arteria. But they become dangerous when they detach and they go to close other venom. When do the plaques detach? When the collagen is not able anymore to take them attached to the walls. So, if the collagen is going to change, <coughs> then the plaques is going to be detached. So, if you study with second harmonic cholesterol and uh, collagen, then you know if the plaques are dangerous or are not dangerous. And then, of course, with Raman maps, you can study also the composition of the plaques. So, this is a very promising tool to study arteriosclerotic plaques in humans with fiber, fiber optics. And with respect to histology, this is the histological image. The optical image has a better contrast and resolution, has a better sensitivity, there is no labeling. And <coughs> as we're telling you, <coughs> it's a potential for automatic image analysis. So let's move to clinical now. Let's move to patients. Until now I show you images on uh, ex vivo samples. Now we move to patients. The way you move to patient is uh, that that microscope is completely built in this uh, small box. And here there is everything. There is uh, the scanning head, there is uh, the detection and this can be excited with uh, two photon, second harmonic, lifetime imaging and Raman. And uh, the laser are not passing throughout the fiber because the fiber are perturbing the laser, especially is, if it, it is passed laser. This is a seven mirror arm that allows you to move this cube in all the direction of the space without uh, perturbing the laser beam inside here. Okay. 
Now this is a drawing of the design inside. And that's it. That's uh, real patients. On the left, it's uh, the granular la layer, which is the most superficial. You see how well the cells, the cytoplasm and the nucleus are visible. Then you go, these are airs, wrinkles. Then you go down deeper. This is uh, the sp spinous layer, the basal layer. And then you go and you check immediately. Oh, the unfortunately. Oh, here we go. This is a Z stack of the dermis, you see? Of, of the collagen. So you can go deep, deep and deep and see the collagen. Why it's so important? Well, take for example resurfacing. Resurfacing, it works that they drill a hole in the skin, for example, okay, and what happens is that this hole drilling inside makes the tissue regrow here and the collagen, the amount of collagen to be much, much higher, okay. I give you an example here of, an, uh, of a woman with an age less than 35 years, so a young woman. If you take the collagen before and after the resurfacing, it's pretty the same. So if there is a young woman that goes to the aesthetic uh, laboratory to make a resurfacing, uh, it, it just wastes money. Okay? Now, then you take a moderate age between 35 and 60 years old. And then here you see that you have a moderate uh, advantage. But the advantage is impressive over 60 years. Over 60 years you have a regrow, an enormous regrow of the collagen. Okay? So that's a follow-up method to, for laser therapy, for example, to study how laser therapy is working. Let's move to a more serious thing, the psoriasis. Psoriasis is uh, a pathology, it's a severe pathology, very severe pathology, that is altering uh, inside of the, of, uh, of the cells uh, the blood vessels, okay, and it's thickening uh, some uh, elongated papillae, which are these ones, okay. So it's a dilated blood vessels, okay, it's elongated derma papillae, this one, elongated red, red ridges and thickening of the epidermis. So the problem with psoriasis is that the dermatologists, they cannot take samples out because it's not a tumor. But then you have to uh, address how severe is the, the psoriasis. And then the way you do that is with the optical uh, non-contact mode. Then immediately you can, for example, in a healthy skin dermis, okay, visualize <coughs> the papilla dermis in second harmonic. And then you do the same in psoriasis, for example. And then if you make the 3D stack, you immediately see that uh, the dimension of papilla dermis with respect to healthy tissues is 60 micron with respect to 28. And the length is 100 micron with respect to 30. So that's a way to see papilla dermis in a wonderful way, very clear, very precise, without removing anything, without touching anything. Now, this is doable on the skin, but when, what about when we want, we want to go inside? We want to see internal organs, for example. <coughs> we want to work on the brain for brain neuro neurosurgery, for example. One of the main issues in neurosurgery is that uh, uh, tumors of brains or uh, epileptic tissues or inflammation tissues is not distinguishable by LT brain. And of course, if they have to remove, they don't want to remove LT brain. So you need to, some tools to individuate optically which is the correct tissue to remove and which is not. The same from the other organs. So 
the way to do that is okay de deliver different lasers to make a multimodal image a multimodal detection spectroscopic detection here are three lasers one at 440 one 378 and the other one 785 these three later lasers are these are pulsed so you can excite NAD and FADH again metabolism and here you can make Raman for the fingerprint everything goes inside of a central laser delivery fiber the central laser delivery fibers it arrives to the sample and then uh, the fluorescence light in the Raman signal it goes to a spectrometer the fiber from once from the two sides as the laser coming inside delivering light uh, perf uh, detecting fluorescence and then uh, the fluorescence is going to the detector if you look at the distal hand okay the central fiber is delivering the light and uh, the other fibers are neighboring so they are collecting fiber they are collecting light and if you see the design it's like this one fiber at the center it's sending photons and here you have excitation and the excited fluorescence then goes in the neighboring fibers so you don't have back reflection here but you with this sort of banana shapes diffusive banana shape you collect sidon and how deep can you go <coughs> here you can go really deep you go deep like this which is about one two millimeter so you can go really deep in this case you lose image you don't have an image you only have an integrated uh, signal coming from this cube but it's very powerful because it's a multi-dimensional spectroscopy so the fiber the 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 the, uh, the endoscope is very narrow so it can enter the ch service channel of uh, a cystoscope for example for inspection of blood there but <coughs> can be used for brain can be used for pancreas can be used for uh, liver and can be used for colon we apply to melanoma and the results were really astonishing when we apply to melanoma we have about uh, 10 malignant melanoma 3 melanocytic, 10 melanocytic nevus 20 healthy skin and 2 seborrheic keratosis and then the difference the results for example if you see the fluorescence emitted when you excite at 378 the melanoma the nevus and the healthy dermis uh, they are completely different the emission so there is a difference in emission and if you go for example for the fluorescence emitted but when you excite with 445 nanometer laser against there is a difference and with Raman against there is a difference so this kind of systems can be very very strong at that point to uh, separate different kind of melanocytic nevus from uh, melanoma and we had a nice example one day one patient came to us it was analyzed by the dermatologist and the dermatologist says remove these nevus because it is malignant before going to excision to the surgery room we analyze with this optical pen and we say oh this is not malignant this is benignous and then we be we beat a pizza on that okay of course in Italy we always spit pizza so um, then he went to the histopathologist and we were right okay so we also pretended the beer of course and uh, so that works that works very very well so uh, this is a promising uh, a tool and maybe we can put together the spectroscopic with uh, the imaging modality okay so let me close uh, with uh, uh, something more dedicated to the anatomy
Okay. We were now looking at uh, a single piece of organ. But in general, it's important to see the wool organ. Because the wool organ has a, a structure which is characteristic of the wool organ itself. If you take the heart, for example, the pathology, the, 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 the structure of the vasculature, the structure of the connections between the cardiomyocytes is typical of a heart and it's a typical of a pathology. If you take a brain, again it's the same. Some mental disorder, as I was saying this morning, they are connected not simply to a behavior problem, not simply to the chemistry, but they are connected to a, a real different structure into the brain. Take the autism, for example. The autism, it was uh, treated by psychologists at the beginning, then psychiatrists, and then we, now we are discovering that an autistic boy, he has a completely different structure of the cerebellum. Take the schizophrenia, take the obsession, the compulsive obsession, okay, a serial killer, that uh, for obsessive comp com uh, compulsion obsession, uh, uh, kill everybody in a room with a machine gun. He has a problem of structure of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Purkinje cells into the, into the cerebellum. So, even Alzheimer, even Parkinson, they have a different structure. So, it would be very important to have a tool that is able to make a tomography of the, cer of, uh, of the brain with a much higher resolution than nuclear magnetic resonance because a nuclear magnetic resonance has a resolution of one millimeter. This is not enough. We must arrive to the cellular level. So it is possible to make a tomography of the whole brain with the cellular level resolution. And that's the ending part of my seminar, whole organ imaging of brain. Now, brain is a uh, uh, it's a real macroscopic challenge because in the brain you have uh, processes like dendrite and spines which are at the level of few hundred nanometer and you need to see that because one of the problems of Alzheimer is that uh, in the very very early stage when you are 30 35 and you have Alzheimer you don't know but you have Alzheimer probably but uh, in a very weak way the Alzheimer is perturbing the connections, so the spines, not creating any, anything bad. But then when the illness goes on and goes on, at the end you have the amyloid plaque, which is destroying the brain when you are 60, 70, 80. But that's the final end, part of the story. That's the, the end of the story. But at the very beginning, it's an alteration of the structure when you are 30 or 35 of those connections. So if you are able to see that in a really advanced, then you can really address uh, the pathology. And then of course did, uh, these, those processes are organized in an arbor of connection. Then your scale goes from 1 micron to 100 micron. This is also important to, to be seen because the arbor of connection into the brain are related to computational characteristics of the human being. And then all these are organized in a bigger structures, which is the brain, which can be tense and tense. We are talking of the mouse in this case, because these measurements, of course, have been done on, on, on mouse. But uh, they can be, of course, a few millimeters. So you need a, a tool which is able to have an image of a few millimeters with a resolution of one micron, like confocal one. And this is very important because uh, many parts of the brain are connected with other parts of the brain by means of bundle of axons. And these connections are not known. So in the brain, we, you need to see the whole organ. You cannot concentrate on one piece here with a resolution of a confocal resolution. You can imagine how big memory you need for that. It's just like making, making a photograph here with one billion of pixels, okay? So it's an enormous quantity of memory. It's about one terabyte for one brain. The way to solve this is to use a, a light sheet microscopy, 
With light sheet microscopy, you illuminate the sample from one side and you look at the perpendicularly. It's just like the computer-assisted tomography. It's exactly the same thing. You take the brain of a mouse, you excise the brain of a mouse, you illuminate with a sheet of light like this, and you see from this direction. Then you move the sheet of light like this, and then you rotate the brain, and you, then you have the tomography, exactly like the computer-assisted tomography. With the difference that here we are using photons. In the assisted computer tomography, we are using X-rays. Now, does it work? Yes, it works, but the problem is that the brain is non-transparent. And uh, if we want to do that, we need a transparent brain. Can we make the brain transparent? The answer is yes. This is the brain, and this is again the brain. You don't see he here, but there is the brain. It's transparent. How can you make the brain transparent? And why the brain is not transparent? Well, the brain is not transparent because there, there is a, a different index of refraction between the water into the brain and the extracellular matrix. And this, this different index of refraction makes the, the photon diffuse inside, like in the milk, and make it diffusive, so non-transparent. The way to make the, the brain transparent, this is a fixed brain, of course, of a mouse, it's removing the water and substituting the water with a liquid which has exactly the same index of refraction of the extracellular matrix. If you do that, here is the results, and this is the divine com comedy of Dante Alighieri in the back, okay? So, we cleared the brain. So, good. Now, can we see neurons? Yes, because the mouse is a transgenic mouse, and a transgenic mouse as the processes in green, labeled in green. So, this is only for physicists, okay? And uh, this is the laser beam. I also described this morning this drawing. The laser beam is uh, creating here a, a, a sheet of light, and then by means of uh, complicated confocal systems, uh, can be illuminated. And. Uh, <clears throat> this confocality is very, very important because, uh, as I was showing this morning, you can see processes well below into the brain. These are, pro these are for example, Purkinje cells, okay? these are axons, and these are dendrites. And this is inside of the brain. The brain is intact, but you see inside of the brain. And then, of course, it's uh, a big work of uh, software analysis because uh, you have to make a volume here. Each volume is 800 stacks, 8,000 planes, and then you have to stitch everything together. But at the end it works, and you build up an entire brain. You can see here, the entire brain can be slices, sliced on different parts, and then you can zoom in inside, as you like, you can go on, you can go on, you can go on, like in the movie Blade Runner, I don't know if you remember, that famous scene. And then, the oldest say yes, the youngest probably they don't know Blade Runner, it's one of the cult movie. And, uh, and then, of course, you can image, you can image inside of the brain some important region, and then what you can do, you can see, for example, some very internal region of the brain, and then uh, you can trace. You can trace the processes. You can trace axons and see where the axons are going. But even more important, you can create a, a, an immersive uh, vision, so you can fly directly into the brain, okay? And this is a fly into the brain, where this is the wool cerebellum, okay? Then you can go in, fly inside. This is, these are real data, eh? this is not a simulation. And then you can, for example, count the number of cells, the displacement of the cells, uh, the connection, and then you can connect all this with the pathology. So future perspectives. 
nonlinear imaging for non-invasive diagnostics and follow-up in dermatology, as I show you. Use of morphological techniques in tandem with chemical function techniques in a morphofunctional approach. Multimodal nonlinear imaging to towards label-free immunohistochemical analysis of tissues. New detection tools in ophthalmology, neurosurgery, oncology of organ, etc. And then, of course, as I was telling you for the neurosurgery, laser imaging detection assisted surgery. So you help the surgeons to remove the proper. You guide the surgeons during the operation. So, first of all, uh, I will thank the people of my group that were participating to this, uh, uh, to this uh, uh, work, but also I think I thank the people from uh, uh, National Research Council, from the Biomedical Campus, from the Institute of Photonics in Jena, for the part of Neuropathology, Department of Clinical Physiopathology, Division of Urology, Dermatology and Human Pathology. And finally, let me thank you for your attention. There is one there. Uh, so, <coughs> uh, so uh, is it working? Okay. Uh, so I was thinking. Uh, what about the damage thresholds for these? Uh, applications you were mentioning, let's say, for the brain or for some other kind of tissue, actually, after taking this image, was the brain actually damaged or not? Or haven't you checked that? Yeah. And that's how well uh, do you know these limits? Yeah, that's a, a very important question. Uh, there is a limit, of course. But every tissue has its own limits because, um, of course, the capacity of uh, absorbing and also the capacity of uh, capability of uh, um, going deeper into the tissue depends from the kind of tissues. For example, into the brain, in the, in the cortex, I can arrive with two photons to image up to 700, 800 microns, not deeper. Uh, with, in the cerebellum, I arrive to 300 microns, in the skin to 200 microns, in the colon 200 microns. What's the correlation with the damage? Yes, because uh, if you go deeper, that means that the, the, the tissue is uh, absorbing less and scattering less. Absorption and scattering are two important parameters to assess the, 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 the level of damage. If the tissue is absorbing a lot, but it's also diffusing a lot, you are not concentrating pretty much the laser, so your laser threshold, laser damage is very high. If the tissue is absorbing a lot and is uh, also uh, um, scattering very, very little, again the threshold is, is high because uh, the laser is absorbed not in the focus but much before. The case in which the threshold is not very high, it's the case in which the uh, systems is uh, not uh, absorbing pretty much and is not scattering pretty much. Then all the power goes into the focus and then where you have the damage. Which kind of damage do you have? You may have a first damage because you are creating a plasmon field. So you are breaking like putting a, a nuclear bomb inside. So second damage you make cavitation because you increase immediately the water uh, temperature, pretty much. If you take a bottle and you increase the water immediately, you know what happened to the bottle? What happened in your case, in your opinion? If you increase the temperature of the water into the bottle very, very, very quickly, you know what happened? Explodes. Explodes. It's a cavitation. And it's nice because uh, they make a movie with a very fast camera 
and they measure the explosion on the skin, you know how it looks like? Exactly like a fungus of an atomic explosion. It's exactly equal, the same. It's a, a small atomic explosion. So cavitation is another problem because of water expansion. Third problem, photochemical effects. The laser produces uh, ROS products, which are oxidative uh, ox single oxygen, which is pretty reactive, which kills cells immediately, like a photodynamic therapy way of working. So which are the limits? It depends. On skin, for example, by using a laser of 800 megahertz repetition rate, 150 femtoseconds, the limit is uh, 60 milliwatts power. If you go higher than 60 milliwatts power, you produce cavitations, and this is not good. Okay? While if you're working on the brain, the, uh, the threshold is much higher. Consider that we are using exactly this, uh, I showed this morning this, to lay make laser ablation of neural circuits, okay? in order to see the reaction of the central nervous systems to a trauma. Okay? And uh, that's the laser power threshold is 300 milliwatts. Very, very high, because it's not absorbing the systems. So you see, it doesn't exist a real, but this is crucial, because if you want to sell an instrument like this, and you want to the approval of the, let's say, of the Ministry of Health, then you need to, to state the threshold. So that's an important point. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, uh, you showed that you can image a transparent brain, but uh, I think if you, if you, will, uh, if you make a, a person's brain transparent, then it will, you can image it, but it will not help uh, a lot in his, uh, well, recovery, because he will, his brain will have been removed, I assume. Uh, so. I understand that uh, even looking at transparent uh, human brains can be good for research, but uh, what, what uh, are there any perspectives to use it uh, on, on live people to, uh, in therapy, actually? Yeah, very good question. Um, it's true that uh, if you remove uh, uh, the brain, uh, it's not bad for the person, except a few cases that they, they do not realize it. But, uh, there are other cases in which people, they can suffer because of it. And uh, of course, this is not uh, intended like a nuclear magnetic resonance systems that uh, in clinics can be used on living patients. But do not forget that, uh, and that's what we are, where we are moving on, because uh, this is working only on animals, because uh, the clearing process is stopped by myelin. Okay, now we, we found a new protocol that is working on human samples. Now we are working uh, with the pediatric hospitals and they have a, a good library of uh, child brains that have uh, problems with tumors and they are unfortunately dead childs, okay? So we can uh, assess that. And uh, this is because, uh, uh, of course, not used in everyday clinics, but uh, it's, it's for research, as you're saying, but it's not a simple research that you do something and then, then it's something that you can use again in the future. In which way? In this way, suppose uh, you are now able to have in the unique computer an image from a, a, a died person, okay? And uh, that, that person has made a lot of examination before dying, has done, has done uh, the nuclear magnetic resonance, molecular markers, cut, pet, whatever, okay? Those images are stored inside. But uh, it's difficult to take an image and another image and compare themselves because uh, uh, you don't have the cellular level to understand how the mechanisms are. Now suppose you, after the, the person die, you can, if the person wants, of course, donate the organ, you can make an image of the entire brain, okay? And you can see, look, this person had a problem that we were not able to see 
because with nuclear magnetic resonance or CAT or PET, we didn't have the cellular resolution. Now we see here, because the resolution of these systems is 1,000 times more than nuclear magnetic resonance. And so we come back to the nuclear magnetic resonance and say, hey, look, with this kind of uh, features, with this kind of problems, we have a, a particular features on the nuclear magnetic resonance that we did not observe before. So we are now able to collect, to connect some feature of the nuclear magnetic resonance with this. That means that in the future, when we see this kind of feature, we know that there must be a problem because of the research. And then the nuclear magnetic resonance uh, in vivo is much more pow powerful in that case. That's the way the research may help clinics. Or another possibility here, taking a mouse with an Alzheimer problem, with a schizophrenia or autistic problem, treat pharmacologically with the, pharma, pharm with the pharmacological compounds which acts on the network and treat the, the sickness from the beginning. Then, of course, you will de develop for humans. But that's also a pharmacological importance, this kind of research when you work on animals, for example. If your question ends, there will be publicly available brain, just uh, okay, so. Uh, when there will be a publicly available brain online when, that you can use your computer and travel into the brain? Just when? Yeah. <laughs> or if and when? <laughs> well, uh, soon probably. Because uh, uh, there was uh, an acceleration in the research of three, four years in the last month that I did not expect. First, the capability to clear human brain, which was not possible before. Second, the capability to uh, have uh, uh, the, uh, mm, this bra those brain labeled post-mortem. Third, the capability to navigate into the brains. Uh, I, this morning I tried to show, I don't know if this is now is possible, a Google Maps, a Google Brain. We make a Google Brain which is inspired to Google Maps and we apply to the brain, okay? So well, it is possible to navigate into the brain, but unfortunately, again, it's not possible to see here. Uh, to navigate into the brain, uh, yeah, I don't see Dropbox also here. Um, to navigate into the brain uh, in remote, okay? So, now yeah, unfortunately, it's not working. So. What we are doing actually is exactly the following. We are in Florence. As I was telling you this morning, we, have a, a fiber, we will have a fiber optics connecting uh, uh, our lab with the high performa performance computing in, uh, in, in, uh, in Bologna, okay? So a, a human brain is a petabyte. So it's a huge amount of uh, information. Will be transferred there. And then we will work in remote. So all this teaching, uh, all this teaching uh, uh, algorithm will, will, will be plugged in directly in remote, in cloud modality, okay? Everybody, now we are working cloud modality. We, the mathematicians, the engineers that are elaborating the images, we are working cloud modality. And then also this Google Maps is working in cloud modality. So the idea at the end is um, to give to clinicians a, a sort of uh, 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 facility that they can access and they, get, they can navigate for that kind of pathology or the other one and so on. Of course you need a thousand of petabyte because every brain is one petabyte. But I think and I hope that in three four years we will be able not to have thousand of brains but at least to, to prove that all this system works and in the last 10, 15 years, we may have probably the, the complete li library of a thousand of, of people. Of course, at that point, you can understand that uh, uh, the privacy, it's, it's a huge problem. And then we have to, of course, cover the identity of people. But the difference is that when Einstein was dying, they, everybody was preserving his brain, but for nothing, because nobody understood how to analyze the brain. Now we have the tool really to analyze why Einstein was more intelligent than others, if he was, 
or it was just for luck, you know, that uh, he discovered what he discovered. So. Now it is. Yeah. Now it is, but I don't think they will give us the Einstein brain. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. Yes, actually, uh, we could be a good excuse to get funds. Thank you for the. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it's a possibility how to just say everything in a digital way, digitalize. Uh, yeah, brain, yeah. Digitalize, yes. Yeah. Don't yeah. Don't the problem is that uh, with these. Uh, way of uh, lab of uh, making the the human brain transparent is even more destructive than the others because we are doing the opposite instead of removing water we are removing completely the grease and uh, substituting with water so the brain becomes like a gel okay and so it's transparent we can label postmortem and the nice things is that we can label specifically a few cells more than others but then of course the brain is gone completely you just have a digital so I think we can we can work or on anonymous people that they want to donate their organ but uh, we we cannot work with celebrity you know because uh, <laughs> celebrity are more important than normal people you know <laughs> Thank you.